Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to what will be our first Holy Communion service for around six or seven months. And uh, I personally am looking forward to being able to engage in that way. And it'll be lovely, I think, for us all to be able to engage with the liturgy in a very fresh way because we haven't used it for such a long time. Just a couple of announcements. Due to the, the new restrictions that were announced on Tuesday, we've had to re reluctantly postpone the, the change of services until further notice. We will run with the, the midweek communion. Hopefully we can manage that okay. So that'll not start to the first Wednesday in October. Okay, so we will have that midweek communion at half past 10 on the first Wednesday in October. Also to say that if, if you all can, please do just remain seated at the end of our service and we'll run through the wee bits of business that we have to do for, for Easter General Vestry. Uh, as well as that, then, I forgot to say last week that Harvest Sunday will still go ahead as normal at half past ten on the second Sunday of October. And if you want to, uh, Davy, to dress a window for you for harvest, then there are still four, four windows left if you wish to do that. So please speak to Davy afterwards or the next week or so if you want to do that. Also, if, I, I don't think I announced that our guest preacher on Harvest Sunday will be Malcolm Kingston, who is rector of St. Mark's Armagh and is a former curate here in St. Mark's. So Malcolm is delighted to come along and be our guest speaker on that Sunday. Is that it? Would you all please stand? We say together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Our opening hymn, 643, Be Thou My Vision.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service of Holy Communion. The words shall come up on screen for us. The Lord be with you. And we join together, Almighty God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write these your laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Therefore, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in his love and his peace. We pause for a moment of reflection. We join together in the words, Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We stand together for the glory. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Just before William brings us um, our readings and we hear a worship song from Caroline and Matthew. We hear our collect for today, which should come up on screen, the 16th Sunday after Trinity. We're reading collect number two. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, hear the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfill them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our epistle is from the book of Acts, chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 23. The next day Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him, and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. 
So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you who sent for me? Why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Here ends the epistle. Gospel. Hear the gospel of our Savior Christ according to Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to, you, to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. We remain standing as we declare together the words of the Nicene Creed, saying, We believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please do be seated, and on our screens will be our kids' talk, which Peter is going to bring to us, and then William's going to bring us our sermon for this morning. Welcome back to church. Um, that's where we're going to be looking at the rest of the story that Leanna had taught us about last week, about Peter and Cornelius in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 10. So last week, Leanna was talking about how God had spoke to both Peter and Cornelius, um, and he had done this to help put in motion a way for them to come together um, to show that Jews and Gentiles, or back then what they were called clean and unclean people, can still come together to love God and to worship God. So where we left off the story was when Cornelius had sent out his friends to go and collect Peter and um, to bring back to his house. So Cornelius had sent out his friends to collect Peter um, and he's really excited about this because Peter was someone who had met Jesus face to face. That had been like imagine him. if William had come to your house to come and speak or imagine if the Queen had come to your house to speak. It would have been on that scale. So once Peter arrived at Cornelius' house, Cornelius then bowed to Peter because he saw him as so important. But Peter said to him, no, stand up. It's not me who's important. It's Jesus 
who I have come to talk about is the important one. So after this, Peter then went into the next room and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. So he's saying here that, well, he once he might have thought of um, others as being impure or unclean. He doesn't deny because God had told him through the vision that everyone is the same under him. Then Peter began to speak to the crowd. Um, I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism. Like, can you think of a time when you would show favouritism? That means that you prefer something over someone else or something else. Um, for example, that you prefer your friend or someone that you like to be in your group when you're working on a group task or something in school um, and you don't choose someone that you don't like pretty much. You're showing favouritism towards your friend there and against you know people that you're not used to. So he goes on here to say um, pretty much preach the gospel of Jesus. Um, now gospel is a bit of a strange word. What this means is the story of Jesus. So it goes from Jesus' birth to his miracles to the parables to his death and resurrection and all the in between. And the gospel is what we as Christians use um, to teach people about Jesus and to tell them about our faith, basically. And after Peter told the gospel, um, people started to listen to this and you know, started to understand what Peter was saying. And because of this, the Holy Spirit then came down on them and started to work in them, which is basically how conversion works. It's converting them to be Christians. So, so Peter saw this and began to make preparations to get them baptised. But news of this spread around the country to different apostles and to other believers. And other believers thought, oh, Peter's baptising Gentiles and Jews at the same time. What's he doing? This is against our laws. Um, so Peter heard about this and explained himself to the circumcised believers. He explained to them that God had come to him in a dream and showed him the sheet with all the animals clean and unclean on them three times to let them know that God doesn't show favoritism at all. He also explained that Cornelius, um, a, a Gentile, um, was asked by God to send for Peter, who we know as a Jew, to teach in his house and to lead in his house. So after Peter had explained all of this, church leaders accepted it um, as the will of God and started to understand Peter's position. So basically in summary of this entire story, you know, God doesn't show favoritism to anyone who wants to believe in him. It doesn't matter what they look like or who they are, it only matters in what they believe. And if you believe in God, then you're grand. <laughs> Thanks. Hi everyone. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try and do it with this on. I was steaming up when I was reading <laughs> the Bible, so we'll see how far I get. I might have to take this off, but we'll try it without it. Or try it with it. Now, to start off, I want you to sit and get really comfy as best you can. I want you to think you're, doing, you're in your favorite chair at home. You've got your favorite piece of music about to press play. And as you do that, I'm going to ask you three questions. Okay. So I'm going to play this piece of music and see how quickly you can discern the following. I was getting lost in the moment there. <laughs> it's funny how classical music is in all our lives, and we don't maybe necessarily... Uh, recognize it. So, the composer is an easy one. It is Hans Zimmer. That's right. Danby, get the movie. Inception. Danby, get the title track. It was called, it's called Time. I wouldn't have, I, I might have guessed the, the composer. 
I didn't know the film. I didn't know uh, the title track. And I've used that for a particular reason. Time is so precious, isn't it? We never know what a new day, a new hour is going to bring. And sometimes time runs out on us, or we don't have enough time. And yet God gives us a very specific 24-hour time period in every day. Now, you all know the difference between someone who says, what time is it? And someone who says, we had a great time. And the Greek language has two words for time that mean two entirely different things. The first one is chronos, which refers to chronological time, minutes and seconds. What time is it? It's 11 o'clock. The other Greek word for time is the word kairos, which means an appointed time an opportune time, an opportune moment, a due season. We had a great time. And the reason I chose the gospel message today from Mark chapter 1 is because it uses the kairos Greek word here. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time, the kairos has, ta- has come. God's appointed time, God's the right time for God to send Jesus into the world. Which Paul the Apostle affirms in Romans 5, where he says, you see, at just the right time, Charis, God's appointed time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Let me give you an example of a Kairos moment in my life, which is probably similar to your life. Before I was converted, God brought about the circumstances which I was completely unaware of. People were coming into my life saying things. I was seeing things. And I felt that something was changing. But I didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until I started to go back to church heard the gospel presentation that I knew that God was knocking on the door of my heart asking me to become a Christian. I didn't understand then it was a Kairos moment. It was God's opportunity to speak to me. I do believe there were other Kairos moments when I was a wee boy sitting in the the vestry of St. John's Church in Rough Island saying to my minister, I think God wants me to be ordained. I believe that was looking back, it was a carous moment, but I didn't respond to him then. So in the weeks running up to my conversion, God just increased the temperature and brought circumstances to place that I found myself eventually in that place of conversion. So think back for a moment about your carous moment when God brought you to faith. How many circumstances did he bring together at just the right time so that you're in the kingdom? And how special is it to think that God's thought so much of me in my circumstances to change my circumstances so that we could hear his voice? It's a beautiful thing. It's a deeply personal thing. Last week, Harry took us through Peter's vision, where God confronts Peter's prejudices, particularly his attitude to the Goyim, the nations, the Gentiles. And we heard that the common commentator put it, the reason for this encounter was to remove the gospel from its Jewish clothing. But this wasn't just a carous moment for Peter. It was a carous moment for the church of Jesus Christ universally. So much so that we'll come to it in the beginning of Acts 11. Peter has to defend why he went to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, to the circumcised believers. 
That's the converted Jews in Jerusalem. And not just the house of any goyim, but a Roman goyim, a Roman centurion goyim, which must have stuck in the throat of those who were asked the question. And we, we get a flavor of this in how Luke records it in Acts 11. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of us uncircumcised men and ate with them. In other words, Northern Irish said, Peter, what are you at? Where was your head? Did the curb not give it away? You were in the wrong place. You know the rules. These are the goyim. And the wonder of all this, the wonder of all Kairos moments, is that God brings together the circumstances, what I call God instances, that only He can do to make these Kairos moments happen. And this was a huge turning point not just for Peter, but the church, but for Cornelius as a goyim. He was standing on the precipice of the kingdom of God. And look how God brought it about. Acts 10, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to them, I'm the only one, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? So God speaks to Peter. And pretty much simultaneously, we read, the men reply, we have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. So while the Lord is speaking to Peter, he's also speaking to Cornelius. Separate instances, separate places, to bring about the circumstances that through Peter, the church of Jesus Christ would have a different attitude to you and I. We're Goyim, we're Gentiles. So that the gospel could bear fruit in human terms in the most unlikely of places. And there is no doubt that this particular Caris moment resulted in what we, know, what we now know to be the Council of Jerusalem, which we'll come to in Acts 15, which was basically like the first AGM of the church, the first Easter vestry. And the main item on the agenda was, what, if anything, do we have to say or tell these goyim to do in order to be full members of the church? Should they be circumcised? or not. Because God is moving amongst these people. So we have to accommodate them. So Peter's vision in Acts 10 does not only have ramifications for the church, for Peter, but it has particular ramifications for Cornelius, his relatives, and friends. And just by the way, we have an extra teaching at no extra cost. This Kairos moment, if you like, is the fulfillment of Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, before the covenant was even cut with Abram. God made Abram a promise. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who, who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And right here, that is being fulfilled. Folks, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we all have to be reminded of that. Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, or free. I love to learn something new when I'm studying. And there's always stuff to learn that you, you've missed. 
over the years. So I'll share something with you that I, I discovered this week that I hadn't noticed before. And again, it's in the detail. Acts 10, 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, the men who Cornelius had to get Peter. And some of the believers from Joppa went along. Now in Acts 11, Peter then goes to Jerusalem to report how the Gentiles are responding to the gospel. And he says this, and I ask myself, why the detail? Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. Question. Excluding the three men who came to visit Peter, how many, including Peter, went to visit Cornelius? Seven is right. These six brothers also went with me. And I discovered this week that seven is the number of people required to validate a case in Jewish law. So when Peter was going to Jerusalem to explain his actions, either he knew he needed six witnesses, including himself, or he didn't know that, but God sent him six. So when he went to argue his case to the circumcised believers in Jerusalem, he had the right number of witnesses to validate what God was showing him. Again, an example of the providence of God in this pivotal, carous moment, which would result in the right decision being made in Acts 15. Folks, God does provide the detail in our lives. The next day, the clear message of Peter's vision was going to be tested. Right, Peter, you've understood what I'm saying. Are you going to put it into practice? So let me ask you a question. You're Peter. What kind of worry, anxiety, what kind of conversation might you be having with yourself as you're on your way to the house of Cornelius? Remember, you've never, ever set foot in the house of a Gentile in your life. And when you're walking along to do a visit, you've got loads of time to think. What conversations might you be having with yourself? What tips might be playing in the background? The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. If that was me, I said, oh, great. Thank you, God, an audience. This is hard enough. I have to go to Cornelius, but you now have an audience for me in which to do this. What's going to happen? As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Here's a goyim, a Gentile goyim, a Roman goyim, a Roman centurion goyim, bowing before me. What might the temptation be for Peter on the basis of all that he knew has ever known as a Jew? R. Kent Hughes thought summed it up lovely. He said, perhaps old tapes of Jewish prejudice were still playing despite his new understanding. If ever there was a moment for Peter to feel superior, it would have been at that moment as Peter stands here and a Roman centurion is bowing before him. Now, be honest with ourselves, folks. We all have old tapes, haven't we? We've been through the troubles. We've been through personal hardships of all kinds, some indescribable. And one of the privileges of being a member of the clergy, and Lucy is no different, is that sometimes you say to us, William, I've never told anybody this, but this is what has happened to me. And again, R. Kent Hughes went on to say, 
In this pivotal moment, Cornelius is standing on the precipice of the kingdom of God. His relatives and friends are standing on the precipice of the kingdom of God. And he went on to say, and the devil likes to press play in situations like this. Don't forget, Cornelius maybe had a few tapes playing too. You're, you're, you're a Jew. We're in charge of you lot. We say jump, you say how high. Instead, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence in front of his family, his friends, maybe his fellow soldiers who were under conviction. Such is his sincerity in seeking after God. And this is Peter's test. The tapes are playing. The kingdom of God is at stake. The devil's pressing play. Peter, remember who you are. Who are these people? These are the Goyim. Heaven and hell awaits the outcome. Stand up. I am only a man myself. And Peter humbly shares what God has shown him. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Wow. I've never been in this house. I've never been with these people. But God has shown me what I need to do. Cornelius answered, Three days ago, while I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. This is every preacher's dream. They are open. They are hungry. God has brought about the God instances, the charis moment for people to be saved. Remember a few months ago I talked about a person of peace. People whom God is preparing to be open to the king and his kingdom. This is exactly what's going on here. Cornelius is a person of peace. He's invited Peter to come and tell us what God wants you to tell us. And in comes Peter at just the right time. God's charis moment. It's a beautiful thing. I remember many years ago in Muckamore, we had a mission. And I invited one household to say, would you host a coffee morning? The man, the woman who owned the house weren't Christians. They weren't even churchgoers, but I got to know them. He says, well, well, surely. Who do you want us to invite? We don't know any church people. I said, great answer. Don't invite church people. I invite whoever. And they did. And then goes William. And we had a marvelous time of question and answer. And there were people who were converted that day who I'd never met. There were people of peace whom God was preparing unknown to me. And all these people need was a preacher at just the right time. It is a beautiful thing. Which is why I began this morning with that opening stanza. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Because essentially that's the message of Peter's sermon. Because for someone to die, the first had to live. He begins how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. 
We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everything who, one who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, that phrase, through his name, is really important. What does Jesus' name mean? Remember the angel appeared to Joseph. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Who Jesus is is tied up with what he does. Therefore, by believing in his name, you're believing in what he has done, not just who he is. And I was thinking to myself this week, how can I teach the people the difference between believing in God and being converted? And the best I could come up with was two words, is and as. This is as simple as I can make it because it needs to be simple for me. Illustration. Boris. We all can say with 100% certainty that Boris Johnson is the British Prime Minister. Yep, he is. Do you believe and accept that he is your Prime Minister? Will you accept him as your Prime Minister? That's your decision. Which is why the phrase, through his name, is very important. Because you may believe that there is a God, and his name is Jesus. But James says, you believe that there is one God, good, but even the demons believe that and shudder, it doesn't matter. But do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because you've accepted what he has done for you on your behalf. So is it is or as? Have you went from is to as? Because I can assure you that every one of you have had at least one carous moment in your life where God has asked you to make him your Savior so that he's not just is the Son of God, but you accept him as your Son of God. And evangelism is really easy when you fit in with what God is already doing. A person of peace. God brings about circumstances and you think, this is unusual. There must be somebody here that wants to speak to me or hear what I have to say. And in the middle of a sermon, the most welcome of visitor turns up. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came and all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Goyim. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So we ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Folks, none of you have any power over God moving in your life in a careless moment. And it brought me to a place of real uncomfortableness. Every corner I turned, God was saying, William, I want you. I want a relationship with you. And he just slowly turned up the heat bit by bit by bit by bit. You see, at just the right time, God's appointed time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly.
There's a wee song that has done going around in my head for the last couple of weeks, which when I play it in my own personal devotions, it makes me cry because the words are so powerful. And it reminded me of the day of my conversion, which is no bad thing. So we're going to play it. Hopefully the words will come up on the screens as as you listen to the girls singing it. It's called King of Kings. Lord God, we give you thanks this morning for the blessing of the Christian church and its communities. We pray that we may each be a faithful witness to the gospel in all that we do and say. Help each and every one of us to know and trust in your timing alone. We pray also today for our church leaders, that they may be led and guided by the Holy Spirit as they seek to lead and guide your people at this difficult time. This morning we also pray for the people of this church, this congregation of St. Mark's. May each person know the Spirit of God upon them and all that they do. And may each and every one of them be comforted in knowing that you are Lord of all and in control of all things. Lord, in your mercy, Creator God, we pray today for our world and the problems that we are faced with. We pray for all those who live under the threat of war and terrorism. We pray especially today for those who have little to eat or a place to rest their head at night. Help us to be a church that gives generously whenever and however we can. And may you, the Prince of Peace, bring healing to the nations. We pray for our own country and we pray for a stability in our current political situation. We ask, Lord, that you would guide our country in the coming days through the inspiration of your spirit. Give to our leaders the grace needed to rebuild bonds of trust once again so that they can move forward and work with both integrity and dignity for the flourishing of all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we pray for your healing touch to rest upon those who are sick, your strength to be felt by those who are tired and weary, your wisdom and your love to encourage those who live in despair or fear. And in a moment's silence, we commit before the Lord our God, those in need of his healing, his presence, his compassion, and his grace this day. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, may your presence be seen clearly in what we do and say each and every day. And may the joy of the Lord be all of our strength. And we join together in the words, Merciful Father. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we join together with the words on screen saying, We do not presume. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. The Lord is here. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty and ever living God, at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and praise. And so with all your people, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and with this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Except through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, grant by the power of the life-giving spirit that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. As we pre prepare to come for communion this morning, just a couple of things. First of all, we will receive communion in one form only, which is the bread. William and I will make our way down the steps. And if you could follow the church wardens, who will start from the back, and ask you to come up and receive communion and then go back to your seats um, around the church. Should you not feel comfortable coming up for communion this morning, then please just give uh, the church wardens uh, a little nod and they will know to move on to the next person. William and I will both be using tongs this morning, so we'll, we will not be coming into contact with the bread. So draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you. Remember that he died for you and feed on him this morning in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say together, our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We join together, Almighty God. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And we're going to stand once again as we close our service with our final hymn, Tell Out My Soul.
One thing I forgot to say earlier on was I bought two temperature check thermometer yokes <laughs> for one term, and we're going to introduce those next Sunday so that when you come into church, everybody feels a little bit safer, okay? So that'll, that'll be happening every Sunday uh, starting next Sunday to give an extra wee layer of safety for you as best we can. So I hope you don't mind that. And we all, everybody then who comes into church will know that everybody in here has the right temperature. If you are a bit rushed and a bit late, you might fail it. You might have to sit down for five minutes and then you should be okay. But we'll just introduce that for an extra layer of caution. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love today and always. Amen.